as you, some of you may not know this, and it may shock you a little bit for me to confess this to you, but I do have a confession to make. I'm a rebel. <laughs> if you did not know that, you don't know me very well. I like to stir up trouble wherever I go. And it started young with me. When I was in college is when it began to blossom and come out. Uh, now, I went to college a long time ago, so you'll have to, some of you may know what I'm talking about, but I was the kind of guy who was always looking to rebel against what the standard flow of things was at the time. And, and this came out most dominantly in my life in terms of the way I dressed and the music that I listened to. That was how I, you know, proclaimed my rebellion. And uh, I listened to alternative music. I was in an alternative, alternative band, believe it or not. Um, I wore a long black trench coat. I had a, a dangling cross ear ring down to here. So if you look closely, you can still see where my ear was pierced. Now, this was back in the 1980s, mind you. Um, and here's what might shock you. I actually wore makeup. <laughs> it was, the, it was, it was uh, more popular back then, I guess, to wear makeup. I didn't wear it because I liked the band Kiss. I didn't like Kiss. That was not my style because Kiss was too mainstream. Um, but I like bands that you, some of you may have heard of these bands, The Cure, The Cult. You know, I was into that kind of thing. And, you know, I, I actually enjoyed being rebellious. Um, I enjoyed get, avoiding trouble. I, <laughs> I, the, the good thing was I'd, I'd never hardly ever got caught doing any of the stuff that I did. Um, I, I've, I've told this story before, but our, our, the college soccer team won the national championship one year. And uh, out at the dorms, all, all these girls had been out there and they put up this big banner to welcome the soccer team back from their victory. And up on the third floor, they ran a rope across and hung this banner on it. And it had streamers all over it. And my roommate and I were watching them put that up. And uh, I turned to my roommate. As they were finishing, the girls were walking back into the girls' dorm. And I said to my roommate, I wonder what would happen if someone lit one of those streamers on fire. And he dug around in his pocket, pulled out a matchbook and said, why don't you try and see what happens? So I did. I went out there and lit the end of one of those streamers and turned to walk away. And as I was walking back to the steps of the dorm, my roommate was looking past me and his eyes were getting bigger and bigger. I turned around and the whole thing was on fire. I mean, it was just burning up, burning up. Pieces of streamers were coming loose. The wind was blowing them across the parking lot and they were landing on cars. And I began to panic a little bit. So I went out there and I was knocking them off of cars, stomping out fires everywhere. And I turned and looked at the girl's dorm. The girl's dorm was across the parking lot from the guy's dorm. And it looked like every girl had her face plastered against the window looking at me. Well, you would think that that's the kind of thing that would get you kicked out of college. It didn't. I don't know how I got away with that, but I did. I think I got a demerit for that. Um, but anyway, you've heard of James Dean, right? The rebel without a cause. That, that was me. I was a rebel without a cause. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, one of the things that I want us to think about in terms of if you, I, I think we all have a rebellious streak within us. I really do. I think it's a part of our nature, our human nature. But for me, I was rebelling because I was wanting to call attention to myself. I didn't really have a reason other than that. I just thought it was a fun thing to do. And hey, look at me. Everybody look at me. But this meal right here that we're going to be participating in in a, in a few minutes is actually a subversive meal. If there's one thing that we as Christians can boast about in terms of us being rebels, it's this meal. You may never have thought of it that way before. Let me explain something to you. The origins of the communion celebration, the Lord's Supper, 
goes back to the first century and it goes back to Judaism. Remember that the Jews practiced this thing called Passover. And what was it for? It was to help them to remember how God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt, right? They had been oppressed by a group of people called the Egyptians and they were living under extremely harsh conditions. And so God enabled them to rebel against that, to get out of that situation. He provided them a way out. It took them a little bit of time to get to the promised land, but they finally made it. In the first century, at the time of Jesus, they were in the promised land. But guess what? They were oppressed, again, by another group of people called the Romans. So they were living under Roman domination in the first century. And just to kind of give you an idea of how serious this was, at, during the time of the Passover and then 50 days later, the Pentecost celebrations, these were Jewish celebrations, uh, these would, people, Jews from all over the Roman Empire would flock to Jerusalem for this. They would come from all over the place. And so the population would swell. The Romans were very nervous about this. And they would send extra soldiers into Jerusalem, into the garrison that overlooked the temple, and put them in there. Because if there was a time when the Jews could rebel, could start a rebellion against the Romans, it would be at the Passover celebration. Why? Because the Passover itself was a memorial to how God delivered them from another oppressor, you see. Now, here's some interesting things that you may not know that really come out to us in Scripture in some interesting ways. Caesar was the ruler of Rome. Did you know that Caesar was also called the Son of God? Did you know that Caesar was called the Lord of Lords? Did you know this? He was considered to be a deity. And in that pagan world, your faithfulness was supposed to be devoted towards Caesar. And Romans actually had, a, had these banquets, these Roman banquets. And at these banquets, the privileged and wealthy would get together. The slaves, which, compromise, which composed about 70% of the population in the Roman Empire, were not permitted to participate in these banquets. Neither were women or children. It was just the wealthy elite, that 10% of the population. And they would have these banquets. And at these banquets, two things would happen. They would serve food and wine. And then, then there would be a time when wine and, and conversation would happen. That was the second part of the banquet. And during that time, they would have libations. You know what a libation is? It's when they would pour wine and offer it up and give a toast. And you know who they toasted? Caesar. And what did they say? Caesar, who is Lord, who is King and Lord, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is what they did. This is exactly how they practiced this. Rome forced people to live under their domination and that treated their subjects horribly. It forced people to pay taxes. It forced people to do things they didn't want to do. And this oppression was felt all the time. The Jews were longing for a deliverer. And they had in mind a warrior deliverer, a warrior Messiah, a warrior king who would come and set them free. Someone like the Maccabees, someone like, someone like Cyrus the Great, who had delivered them in the past when they were under bondage. This is what they were looking for. But something different happened for them. The Messiah, Jesus, came. And he offered a different kind of kingdom than what they were expecting. He offered them a kingdom that was not based upon force, violence, and power over other people. But rather, it was a kingdom that was based on mercy, forgiveness, and love, and acceptance of all people. No matter their stratification in life, no matter their gender, no matter anything, everyone was welcome in Jesus' kingdom. And this was probably the most shocking thing 
that people in the Roman world would have seen and experienced. They would not have understood this. They would not have understood it at all. In fact, in the book of Acts, when word gets to the ruling elite about what the apostles were preaching, they described it this way. They said, these people who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Because they were literally turning the world upside down. Because the kingdom that Jesus offered was entirely different than the kingdom of the Romans and the kingdom of any worldly power or government offers. You see, every government, every empire, every kingdom functions under the power of coercion and oppression. This is how you keep people in line, you see. But here's something interesting. The early Christians, especially those that lived in those Greco-Roman cities that the Apostle Paul had gone to and sent letters to, they took that Roman banquet and they used it as a part of their celebration of the Lord's Supper. They called it the love feast. And at this feast, everyone was welcome. The poor and the women and the children did not have to peer through the windows to see what was going on inside. They were welcome to come and sit at the table and participate in that banquet that represented the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. This was entirely different. It was shocking to the Romans. They did not understand it. They thought these people were crazy. Can't you see that people are born to be slaves? Can't you see that women should be used and not treated as equals? Can't you see that children are not to be put at the same status as adults? This is what the mentality was at that time. But the kingdom of Christ was not imperialistic. It was not coercive. It was welcoming. It was welcoming to all. This is what we celebrate because we are, if we are followers of Christ, we are a part of his kingdom. And if we are followers of his kingdom, we need to live consistently with that, with those principles of his kingdom. This means we are to be a people who emulate mercy, forgiveness, grace, and love. And when we fail to do that, we fail to live up to the kingdom that we say that we are a part of. It's no wonder that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church at Corinth, was so disturbed by the fact that the love feast, that banquet that they celebrated, had been turned into something else. Because there were people who were excluded from it because they were poor, because they were not seen to be worthy to partake of it. He writes to them and he chastises them for this. And this is what we read about in 1 Corinthians 11. He's very perturbed about this. And he goes so far as to say that if they partake of this in that manner, that they are eating and drinking judgment, God's condemnation upon them. That's how serious he saw this. Let me explain to you the elements here that we have. We have the bread we have the wine. Now, this isn't real wine. It was grape juice, but you get the point. What does the bread represent? It represents the body of Christ. We are all a part of the body of Christ. Even though we are individuals, we are one in that sense. If we don't act like it and we take from this, we eat this bread, we are telling a lie. That's what we're doing. We're saying we're one when we're not. This was what Paul's concern was. When we take of the cup of wine and we drink it, we're saying that we're drinking of the cup of the new covenant. The new covenant says that we are cleansed by the blood of Christ. And because of that, we, though, though from diverse backgrounds, are all a part of the same covenant. But when we don't act like it, we're telling a lie. You see, 
This was what Paul's concern was. And I'd like to read from this passage and invite you to participate in this celebration, in this banquet. It's interesting. Even in the Old Testament, the kingdom of God is always described in terms of a banquet. That's why I wanted you to eat together this morning, because I wanted you to see the picture that is painted for us in Scripture. It's a banquet that gives, that provides lavish foods and beverages. And we want to picture that because we are all part of that banquet. It's a, it's a banquet in which we are feasting on the love of God and his mercy that has been given to us through the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. Think about what Jesus did for us. He came into this world, became a human being like us, he experienced all the same things that we experience, was tempted in all the areas that we are tempted, yet he remained pure and without sin. Despite that, he was viciously butchered on a cross and hung there naked. And it was a mockery of justice, his trial, in terms of what happened to him. He took on the evil and the sinfulness of this world upon himself and took that on so that we could be free from it, so that we could see what God's love looks like. He was willing to take it upon himself. Most of the evil that happens in this world occurs because of what we do to one another. And God is saying, this is not what I made you for. I made you for something better. And that's what we need to be a part of. This church, I like to say, those of you who attend here know this. This church is supposed to be an outpost for the kingdom of God, which means we need to be different we need to be showing the community around us what God's kingdom looks like. That it is a kingdom that has turned the world upside down. That's what we need to be. I'm going to invite a couple of the guys to help me. And I want to invite you to participate in this communion service at this time.